this idea that cinema uh, is a visual medium, is a visual discipline, uh, perhaps it was a visual discipline. It is, I think in my mind, no longer a visual discipline. And it again connects with the idea of the meaning. Uh, uh, I, I find that if you look back, uh, there was a great uh, development, uh, you know, in Europe during the Renaissance and parallel to that there was a great development everywhere else of a certain visual culture. Especially in during the Renaissance they developed perspective. Perspective meant a new way of appropriating space. They added a quality of the foreground, background, middle ground and uh, the the reality perspective resulted in a kind of a reality which is a new, as a new appropriation, a new meaning. It resulted in many different things. It was a, perhaps the greatest revolution of modern times. It, it, uh, it created cartography where whole map making changed and colonization was possible. It changed the whole art scene completely. It changed music because it created Western music, the foreground, middle ground, background, the whole system of symphonic music took on a different turn after the perspective. Even the idea of literature altered. Uh, uh, for instance, the idea of convergence, when two parallel lines are not supposed to converge, but in perspective that's what we are taught, which is just a defect of the eye, that the lines actually come to a convergence. If you look at literature and music in the West, you will find that from the earlier Greek time, the, the narrative took on a new form altogether. The narrative took on the form of argument, counter-argument and resolution. So where the conversions took place of an argument and a counter-argument became a climax. So it's very surprising that uh, even in music, in Western music, uh, this whole idea of small climaxes coming to a big climax, it's like the idea of perspective Converses. If you look at the narratives before the Renaissance, you find that there is uh, uh, there are uh, uh, there are stories you know that are like in Mahabharata or, or any other epical text you know you will find that there are arguments, counter arguments, and uh, uh, you know it goes on and on. But in the narrative, someone is going to kill somebody, for example, you know, it just happens in one verse, you know, at the end. But what Renaissance gave was a strange development towards the climax you know, and it became a universal form, completely universal form. It has, since then, it has existed and it is dominating our lives. It is dominating our lives to such an extent that we cannot even describe an event. If I have to describe to you an event, a small event, and if I don't resolve it, if I don't bring it to a climax, I don't resolve it, bring it to that kind of resolution, uh, and leave it open, uh, you, will, you will feel I'm not communicating enough. You will feel that I'm, 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 I'm not making my point at all. So all the efforts that have been made by modern artists, modern filmmakers, I am Jules Arvindan, and I've done my own modest contribution, where one has attempted to keep forms open-ended, not coming to a, a conclusion of that sort, uh, always run into difficulty with the audience. Because the, 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 the culture is so deep as the idea of the climax, even in the most vulgar sense, uh, it's, a, it's just an issue so deep-rooted in us, you know, that we cannot imagine the actual pleasure of existence, actual pleasure of knowing, understanding, without necessarily reaching an end. And I think that appropriation of image, you know, that the Renaissance created, which spread all over the world, gave us, you know, uh, a kind of imagery, a kind of uh, 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 visual culture that we haven't got rid of till now. Till now, that continues, and actually, I think, we are suffering from it. When somebody says, you know, that he's making a film on a piece of literature, and that literature is evocative of some images, you know, that, that literature makes him feel as if there are some images coming to his mind when he reads. Those images are an abstraction for literature. That is not the material for literature. When I use some words and I create that absent image, 
which is behind those words, then I'm creating an abstraction which is a source of experience for me. But suppose if I were to film that image that the literature is creating, it comes to nothing. That wonderful tree created by a poem, I can't film it because when I go and film a tree, what can I do with it? I can't do anything with it, it's just a tree. So, what would I do? I would create more visual effects. I would force some kind of lighting on it, I would force some kind of special effect on it, I would create some kind of... Uh, I would force the meaning on the image. Because the image itself has no meaning. So, what I'm trying to say now, that we have come to a stage with television, advertising, consumerism, that the whole visual culture uh, has become totally meaningless. And it is, I think, for filmmakers, and I'm actually what I'm suggesting to you is not something that I have myself accomplished. I'm actually raising this question for myself and I'm raising it for you so that we can have a debate and I'm in the midst of it. It's not as if I've solved any problem. Yet. But I find that as long as we do not understand this, that the power of the image uh, is finished. And it is precisely for this reason that the power of the image has been bought by consumerist advertisers, televisions, uh, it's, it's finished. It's precisely because of that, that now there is special effects. That the whole idea of the special effect is to actually again engulf the audience, to take the audience into this uh, notion you know, of, of image consumerism. So from here, where can we go? Where can cinema go, you know? How can cinema actually create a new relationship, a new whole? Earlier, when we wanted to structure a film, we obviously thought in the, the vocabulary of images, you know, and we structured our work. But today, if you do that, if I, if I find a well-composed shot, it, it doesn't do anything to me. It doesn't do anything. Because the whole, the, 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 the basic uh, position of the appropriation of space, you know, with which we are organizing the space and making an image, and we are using the space, we are creating an image, is, is based on this, on this dichotomy of a sacred space and a profane space. And that's how the whole relationship with space works that in society itself there are areas, there is a temple that is supposed to be sacred. Then there is a brothel which is not supposed to be sacred, which is profane. There are different shades of profanity and sacredness with which space confront us. Anywhere, any, any society, in any geography you will find this division. So that a certain kind of relationship is expected when you go to become somebody else when you go to a so-called profane space, you know. And this dichotomy, in actual fact, the idea of morality, is anyway come to an end. If you really ask me, you know, I mean the whole moral value today, the idea of being moral or immoral, uh, it is of no consequence today, the way how rapidly the whole world is being globalized and developing. More and more, there is at stake about the question of the moral and the immoral, you know. So the, the relationship with this, this relationship with space, this relationship with creating images has a lost its meaning completely. So I believe that, and this is a topic I've been involved with for the last one or two years, I believe that when we make films, we always seem to forget that a film is expressing itself in images, but actually it is also happening in time. Film, to me, is not a visual medium. It is actually a temporal medium. It is a medium of time. And that is the reality. I think when you enter the realm of duration, for example, enter the realm of rhythm, you therefore enter the realm of tension, then, then it's how the thing is composed. Because in the idea of the composition is again the same dichotomy, you know, between the sacred and profane. I am composing a shot, I place my camera here, then I move my camera from here to here, and I tell my camera one that this is a space, you know, which is sacred, which means what? Meaningful, significant. That is 
what is going to make my meaning. In that, if suddenly something comes, suppose a mean falls or something that was not wanted comes in, something which is at random, which is not required, comes in, and it completely destroys us. That idea, that, that idea of the significance of that shot. So you say, no, no, cut it, cut it, I won't take it again. Okay? Because all this, this nonsense came in some shirts, you know, I don't want that. Because he has created a sacred space. By sacred, I again mean only significant or meaningful. I don't mean in any religious or moral sense. But it is that. Because that which is at random, what is at random, uh, is, is making this whole thing meaningless. But in the life that we are living, there is nothing but randomness today. Violence is random, the, our lives are random, our developments are random. I mean, uh, there is so much randomness in our life today. It has become totally unstructured. And in fact, if we cannot make a film, this random development of mobiles, for example, <laughs> and it's just, it's, uh, Actually, I am not disturbed by it, and that's what I am trying to say. That this randomness in fact is not a disturbance. In fact, I am trying to say how to include this randomness. How to make this randomness a part of our expression, a part of our meaning. How can we, for example, include this and then make a new kind of a whole that is able to embrace this uncertainty, randomness, and not go by structure, the idea, ideation, you know, and just make a film which is one idea, you know. That I think will only happen if we find a new relationship with the idea of duration, time, and think that how if a shot starts and lasts for a certain time, like music for example, there's only tone, but how long the phrase lasts, how long somebody is using something, how short it is, how long, what we call uh, in music, which I'm, I'm also very involved in, you know, like in particularly in Shwad, which is a North Indian form of music, and it is actually based on uh, recitative traditions. And recitation itself is dependent upon what we call risk and Diri, you know, there are three forms of it. But there are many other factors that are temporal, that, that describe time. How can time affect, you know, our narration? How can we actually not care for the idea of the composition and include the randomness? How can somebody acting give me a sense of the kind of attention? The quality of attention, once the quality, what are we looking for in a work of art? I think it's that particular quality of attention that the work is able to generate. That's the power of a work of art, that when you see. It's not a question of, uh, well, somebody could be preoccupied with some political issues, social issues, that's another matter. But ultimately, if it's a work of art, it is a certain quality of attention and it is able to displace. And it is this attention that is at stake because it is faced with that kind of randomness. And how can we include this, you know? And I think this can only happen if uh, we, if we are, if we are going to look at cinema in a completely different way now, I, I have a feeling, somehow, I'm not too sure because I'm a film man, and most of my films are made in 35, and like all of us, I didn't, I think probably made one film in 16. I think that the new development of the digital uh, has a has something in it that fascinates me. And I'm not too certain as to as to how can it solve this problem. But the idea of fragment, for example, which was in our minds during the, during, during the time we make films, like a fragment is a shot. And a shot is very important. A shot is a special, like made of space, fragment, which is very important for film. So, and it's a construction of such fragments. So that when we take a shot, it's very important to say, start camera. And when we end the shot, we also very important cut it. And in fact, often directors then they say, cut it or cut it or whatever expression they have. You can almost know whether he likes the shot or whether like it, you know. So that, that becomes a, a very structured sort of space, you know, that he has created. When you look at video, I mean, it's ridiculous. Nobody will say, start video, cut it. It doesn't make sense. Fragment doesn't make any sense anymore because the whole relationship with the space is altered.
the video is forever. You put it on, it goes on for one hour at least. When you, and now they are doing the hard disk, it will go on the whole day, maybe. Where there is no notion of the fragment anymore. So the idea of duration is completely altered. Whereas we were dealing with fragments, now we don't have to deal with them. So that there is nothing that I can tell an actor, for example, that within this shot you have to do this. That's not the idea anymore. You know? I mean, it will take on a completely different form altogether. It will, the story will take on a different form. The, uh, the whole idea of short taking will take on a different form. Short itself will lose meaning to my mind. You know. Will that happen with the digital? Can cinema do it? You know, I am very uncertain. But I, to this very uh, wonderful occasion, wanted to raise this question and perhaps have a dialogue with you. Uh, I will stop here now and be very glad to answer, join you in a dialogue uh, if you have any questions. Thank you.